Good morning, everyone. I'm incredibly proud of the results we're presenting today and of the work our people have done to get us here. Before we talk about our 2023 performance, it's worth reflecting on the increased conflict and instability we're facing in Europe, the Middle East, and other parts of the world. These global events bring into sharp focus how essential our work is in the defense sector, helping protect national security and providing critical capabilities. As we walk through the financials and opportunities ahead, we hope you'll be left with three clear messages. First, 2023 was another year of strong operational and financial delivery, with high quality earnings and cash flow. Second, we have made significant strategic progress that positions us well for the future, particularly with GCAT, AUKUS, and our newly completed acquisition of Ball Aerospace. And third, for the reasons I will outline in the next few minutes, we have the visibility and confidence to deliver on the value compounding model that we've spoken about before. 2023 has been another excellent year for the business. Through our continued focus on operational performance, we have translated our order backlog into record annual sales and quality earnings, supported by another year of outstanding cash flow. That performance was driven by a second consecutive year of exceptional order intake, totaling £75 billion over two years, with a focus on appropriate contract structures. Importantly for the future, this has significantly increased our backlog, positioning us even more strongly than last year for sustained top-line growth, good cash generation, and margin expansion for the long term. It is worth noting that once again, most of this order volume was driven by program positions which existed prior to the Ukraine conflict. While some Ukraine-related orders are starting to come through, restocking and the impact of ongoing defense spending increases will be evident further down the line. We ended the year with a strong balance sheet which supports our disciplined capital allocation approach. Reflecting our strong in-year performance and our confidence in the outlook for the group, today we're announcing a proposed final dividend of 18.5 pence per share and 11% increase on last year. In 2023, we further enhanced our track record of operational and financial performance as we delivered against the business evolution targets we laid out three years ago. The macroeconomic backdrop has been challenging with COVID impacts, supply chain disruption, and high inflation, which is why I'm particularly proud that in the last three years, we have delivered 20% sales growth, 80 basis points of margin expansion, over 100% cash conversion, and 4.2 billion pounds in shareholder returns while simultaneously increasing our investment in the business. 2023 was a year of significant strategic progress with three major advancements, which all point to our enhanced long-term strength and relevance. First, AUKUS, a groundbreaking three-nation announcement last March, was followed up in October by around four billion pounds of funding for the next phase of work on the UK's next generation attack submarine and early design and mobilization activities are underway. Second, on the Global Combat Air Program, or GCAP, ministers from Japan, Italy, and the UK signed an important treaty for the shared design and development of this next generation fighter aircraft. Third, in August, we announced the acquisition of Ball Aerospace, which marks a step change in our space domain capabilities. In parallel, we have expanded our investment in the business to support our growth outlook with increases in capex and total R&D. Given the long cycle nature of many of our programs, I am particularly pleased with how our teams have stepped up recruitment with nearly 7,000 net employees hired, including just under 2,500 new apprentices and graduates. This is vital for the future delivery of our long-term projects. Moving to the acquisition of Ball Aerospace, for my part, I want to underline a few key points. This was a unique opportunity to add a high-quality, technology-focused business in the highly relevant space domain. Its capabilities strengthen our world-class multi-domain portfolio and broaden our customer exposure in the U.S. and to fast-growing areas of the defense and intelligence community budgets. We see the business as an excellent cultural fit and expect that down the line we have the opportunity to drive revenue synergy 
with our electronic systems business and through our global reach. We are delighted to have completed the transaction and Tom will cover the wide breadth of capabilities in the business later. With strong momentum behind us from our last three years of consistent delivery, a record order backlog and our largest ever acquisition completed, we look forward to the next three years with even greater confidence. Our ambitions for the coming years are built upon strong foundations and will enable continued strong operational performance and contracting discipline. Investing appropriately to support growth and our customers' priorities. Deepening our partnerships and collaborations. Brad will cover capital discipline for the group, but I would add here that we expect the acquisition of all aerospace to be additive to our top-line growth, margin expansion, and cash conversion outlook over time as we look to deliver a compelling and predictable value compounding model for our stakeholders. Brad, over to you for the financials and 2024 guidance. Thanks, Charles. It has been a very strong year across the business. At BA Systems, we take great pride in helping our government customers meet their primary obligation of keeping us all safe. In a time of rising geopolitical tensions, our teams delivered at record levels to protect those who protect all of us. I thank them for their outstanding efforts, their dedication to the mission, and their enduring commitment to operational excellence. And across the board, our financial metrics show the results of their hard work. With orders of 38 billion pounds surpassing last year's record, our backlog hit a new record of 70 billion pounds. And as Charles will later describe, the unrecorded backlog of contract positions and visible demand is nearly four times higher than this. For 2023, top line growth was 9%, surpassing our guidance expectations with all sectors delivering above the expected ranges. A key feature of this growth was the accelerated pull forward of dreadnought activity, contributing to a 22% overall increase in Maritime's top line growth. We also had strong commercial gains in our ES business, while Hagwin's growth lifted P&S results as CV90 programs gathered pace. The air sector was up 4%, led by work on our sixth generation Tempest program. Our profitability in the form of underlying EBIT rose by 9% to just under 2.7 billion pounds. Improved margins in air and P&S offset the margin headwind presented by the mix effects of higher growing submarine activity which trades at a regulated profit. EPS grew by 14% on the higher profit figure, further complemented by higher interest income and the impact of the ongoing share buyback program. We delivered a record 2.6 billion pounds of free cash flow with the business well on track to achieve our in-flight cash guide. In addition to the cash effects from the record profits, we received a net increase in customer advances of a billion pounds. We continued to invest in the business as CapEx exceeded depreciation by 300 million pounds. We continue to follow our disciplined capital allocation policy, returning 1.4 billion pounds in dividends and share buybacks in 2023. As Charles mentioned, we have proposed another increase in our dividend, taking it to 30p, marking our 20th year in a row of increased dividends. So as you can see, this picture reflects a well-positioned business delivering strong top-line growth double-digit increases in earnings, with balanced capital allocation driving value accretive returns. I will now break down a few of the headline numbers, starting with a record-setting order volume of 38 billion pounds. Our ES business posted a book-to-bill of 1.2, featuring a number of key wins across electronic combat, C4 ISR, precision strike, and commercial air. PNS expanded its backlog to 11 billion pounds on the back of nearly 8 billion in new orders, including the Czech CV90 award and higher volumes of combat vehicles in the U.S., including Bradley, AMPV, and Tim. Archer orders for Sweden and Radford munitions also contributed. The air sector posted 11 billion pounds of orders, including the Typhoon support renewal for KSA, orders for NBDA, including missile defense in Eastern Europe, and further renewals of F-35 volumes. In the UK, important funding for the Tempest program was added, along with funding for the next generation radar for Typhoon. The maritime sector achieved 10 billion pounds in orders, led by the 3.9 billion order for the SSN AUKUS design work, representing an important milestone for the program. 
Maritime also recorded a further 3 billion pounds in dreadnought funding, along with new awards in Australia and munitions in the UK. Finally, the cyber and intelligence sector posted a book to bill over one across a number of restricted programs in the US and key national security and C5 ISR wins in the UK. On to sales, the group posted 25.3 billion pounds, representing a 9% increase over 2023. By sector, ES grew by 9%, reaching 5.5 billion pounds, led by large gains in the commercial business in both civil aviation and power and propulsion, along with strong gains in electronic warfare-related sales. ES classified programs decreased by 22% year-on-year. PNS rose by 8% to 3.9 billion pounds, with Haglund's accounting for two-thirds of the sector's growth, while ship repair increased by 9%. Across the PNS portfolio, nearly 600 vehicles were delivered in the year. The air sector hit 8.1 billion pounds in sales, rising by 4%. The sector posted strong gains in F-35, MBDA, and KSA, while the Tempest program more than doubled year on year. These gains helped to offset the maturing Qatar Typhoon build activity. Across the group, the biggest increase in sales came from a maritime sector, which rose by 1 billion pounds, or 22%, to reach 5.5 billion pounds. Higher and accelerated activity across the submarine programs led to the largest share of growth, accounting for two-thirds of the sector's expansion. Work on Type 26 Batch 2 provided a further uplift, while Australia sales were up by 12% on Hunter-class activity. The cyber and intelligence sector rose by 6%. Growth was 9% normalizing for the divestment of the financial services business last year. There was a strong 10% growth in the U.S. part of the business, while growth in the U.K. included a 19% increase in national security cyber. The high sales growth for the group led to a 9% increase in underlying EBIT to just under 2.7 billion pounds. Strong operational delivery across the group enabled a stable margin despite the mixed headwinds from the unprecedented maritime growth which trades at a lower margin. ES grew EBIT by 5%, with margins of 16.1% in the guided range. The sector absorbed lower pension FASCAS recoveries, accounting for about 60 basis points of the margin reduction, partially offset by higher commercial activity. As you know, the FASCAS story is one that impacts the broader industry, and this will be something I mention when we get to 2024 guidance. PNS expanded margins by 20 basis points, reaching 9% for the year on improved profitability and ship repair and strong delivery from Haglund. Air delivered 80 basis points of margin expansion to reach 11.8% on higher activity and risk retirement. Maritime's EBIT rose by 20% on the strong sales growth. The margin of 7.7% reflects the more dominant portion of submarine revenues in the mix this year. Finally, in line with guidance, the cyber and intelligence sector's EBIT fell due to research investments in the UK on space and multi-domain networking. The business delivered record operating cash flow of over 3.2 billion pounds, representing a 26% improvement over the prior year. In addition to the increased profit of 200 million pounds, there was a net inflow of customer advances of over 1 billion pounds. These positive moves more than offset the higher capex over depreciation as we continue to invest for future growth. The lower cash conversion in maritime is an example of this investment as work continued on the ship hall in Glasgow to further improve the efficiency of the Type 26 delivery. With the strong cash delivery, net debt was cut in half, ending the year at just over a billion pounds. As you can see in the waterfall, the 3.2 billion pounds operating cash flow, net of interest and tax, led to a free cash flow of 2.6 billion pounds. We allocated $1.4 billion in dividends and buybacks and entered 2024 with a strong balance sheet, positioning as well for continued strategic flexibility and the upcoming financing for the ball acquisition and debt maturities. Turning now to guidance, given all the moving parts this year, I wanted to start with a simple view of organic growth expectations, excluding ball. On the back of the very strong 9% growth in sales in 2023, which featured about 300 basis points of pull forward sales in maritime, organic top line growth in 2024 is expected to be between 5 and 7%. We expect growth across all sectors led by continued momentum in submarines for maritime, commercial sales in ES, 
and Haglund's and Bofors growth from PNI. Further sector details are in the supporting material. For EBIT, organic growth is up 6 to 8 percent with modest margin expansion. This year, we will have the last material impact related to FASCAS U.S. pension credits rolling off, which represents about a 30 basis point decremental hit at group level. This is more than offset by P&S moving to double-digit margin as AMPV moves to full rate along with some expected margin progression across the rest of the group. In terms of EPS, the organic growth would be up 7 to 9 percent as we absorb the impact of higher tax rates in the U.K. We have modeled $500 million in buybacks. Having sharply outperformed the free cash flow in 2023, and given much of this came from higher than expected advances, which will partially unwind, free cash flow is expected to be in excess of $1.2 billion for 2024. With 2023 free cash at 2.6, that's in excess of 3.8 billion pounds over the 23 and 24 period. On this slide, you will also see the impact of the Aristana IPO, which takes 100 basis points off of the organic outlook just presented on sales, EBIT, and EPS. The IPO resulted in an incremental cash inflow of 180 million pounds. And while this does not count as free cash flow, the proceeds will, of course, strengthen the balance sheet and enhance our strategic flexibility. Now that I have discussed the organic picture, I wanted to highlight the assumptions around ball so you can understand this impact of total guidance. We were very pleased to complete the acquisition last week. Our U.S. team is already implementing a comprehensive integration plan, and we are very excited to welcome our newest team members into VIA Systems. At the top of this slide, you can see a screenshot of the assumptions we presented to you for the acquisition back in August. You might have seen their 2023 numbers released earlier in the month. They highlight an opportunity pipeline of $9 billion, which is an improvement from what we presented in August, and gives us good visibility of growth in the coming years. While their sales number was flat due to some timing delays, we expect low double-digit growth in 2024 and across the medium term, consistent with our acquisition pace. Pleasingly, Ball's return on sales of 11.1% demonstrated strong operational delivery, producing EBIT in line with our acquisition assumptions. And we expect this group accretive margin to carry on in 2024, which combined with the revised sales guide aligns the estimated earnings outcome with what we outlined last August. Looking further out, you will recall that we expect to convert synergies over time, which should see this business get to at least 12% return on sales once matured. In terms of cash flow, we expect the acquisition to be accretive in 2024, including the benefit of the tax asset. Across the medium term, our assumption of 80% cash conversion remains unchanged. Here is our restated guidance at group level, taking into account the IPO and the ball acquisition. For sales, I previously outlined the 5 to 7% organic growth range. The Ariston impact removes 100 basis points and the inclusion of 10 months of ball aerospace sales adds 600 basis points, which moves us to a 10 to 12 percent top-line guidance range over 2023 for the group. For EBIT, the 6 to 8 percent organic growth is reduced by 100 basis points from the Aristana transaction. The addition of ball adds 600 basis points of EBIT growth, taking us to a revised growth target of 11 to 13 percent. For EPS, the organic guide of 7 to 9 percent is impacted by 100 basis points from Aristana. The 10-month earnings of Ball are offset by the interest expense, leading to a revised EPS guide of 6 to 8 percent growth. The higher tax rate in 2024 is expected to impact earnings growth by around 300 basis points. As a reminder, we have not included any synergy estimates in our Ball assumptions for 2024 and these will add at least a further $30 million of incremental profit as a run rate once converted over the medium term. We continue to expect Ball to be accretive to earnings in 2025, the first full year post-acquisition. Free cash flow will be improved by 100 million pounds from the inclusion of Ball, taking 2024 guidance to greater than 1.3 billion pounds. And to remind you, there are also IPO proceeds of 180 million pounds not included in this number. There are some more detailed bridging schedules in the supporting material. We continue to provide three-year cash guides as we feel this helps to iron out some of the in-year volatility that can arise from advanced movements, offering a better reflection of cash delivery. 
Since 2020, our sharper emphasis on cash conversion in our strategy has included initiatives to de-risk detention, improve operational delivery, create incentive targets based on cash delivery, and place a stronger focus on working capital efficiency. Those measures, together with higher levels of advanced intake, have led to consistent outperformance since we began our three-year guidance back in 2019. With our 2024 guidance, our in-flight 22 to 24 cash flow should now exceed 5.5 billion pounds. Our 23 to 25 delivery should exceed the 5 billion pound mark. And for the period of 24 to 26, we expect to exceed 5 billion pounds. And with the higher cash flows, we have been able to grow our investments in our people, invest in our capacity to drive efficient growth, and invest in R&D to drive differentiation in what we deliver to our customers. After increasing our allocation across these internal investments, we have also been growing our dividend consistently as earnings have grown, and we have maintained our policy of having dividends covered approximately two times by earnings. And we have also used our strong balance sheet to enhance the portfolio through M&A. The ball acquisition is an exciting example of that strategy in action, but others, including the GPS and radios business and EF, Prismatic, InSpace Missions, and Bohemian Interactive all form a pattern of value accretive additions to the portfolio. We have also divested out of non-core businesses as we continue to dynamically reshape the composition of our business aligned with our strategy. Our share buyback program has also been an important part of our capital allocation toolkit. Since we started this in 2020, we have retired over 7% of our share count. We continue to value this form of allocation as an important way of returning cash to our shareholders. As can be seen in our recent financial history, as well as our outlook, we have a proven model of a strong business driving top-line growth, increased profitability, and higher cash conversion, fueled by capital allocation that results in a compounding effect through effective deployment. We are well positioned to drive this compounding model into the future. Back to you, Charles. Thanks, Brad. Now I'll outline why we believe we're well positioned for good, sustained, top-line growth. As we've explained, the business has made significant strides in recent years and we're well positioned for a period of sustained growth. Our confidence comes from the focus we have brought to operational execution and contracting discipline that has resulted in better performance for our customers and financial results for our shareholders. Our geographic breadth and domain strength mean that our portfolio does not rely on a few major programs. The pension is now in surplus and we are growing our workforce across the group and attracting our next generation of talent through expanding our apprenticeship and graduate programs. We have taken a dynamic approach to reshaping our global portfolio to higher growth, more advanced technology businesses that align with our customers' priorities and divested businesses that are not core to our strategy. Building on that foundation, our aspirations for the future grow as our customers around the world address the elevated global threats. Long-term defense spending commitments, political alliances, and record orders all strengthen this conviction. Our market differentiators start with our capabilities and technologies. Within BAE Systems, we have evolved, diversified, and strengthened our portfolio so that no one program represents more than 10% of group revenues. We have unique capabilities to design, build, and support air, land, sea, and space platforms alongside leading electronic warfare and defense cyber portfolios. Many of these are proving highly relevant at this time. This diversity means we are well positioned to offer superior platform and technology solutions to our military customers as they focus on critical, multi-domain, and interoperable capabilities with major multinational collaborations like AUKUS and GCAT being two excellent examples. We are continuing to invest in our existing capabilities and new technologies to maintain a competitive advantage. The five core technology areas listed are driven by the evolving threat landscape and support our aspirations for growth. At a tactical level, the conflict in Ukraine is highlighting the importance of a number of these key technologies especially autonomy, space, synthetic training, digital and multi-domain capabilities. We are driving innovation through research labs embedded in our business sectors, including Fast Labs in the US, Red Ochre Labs in Australia, and Falconworks in our air sector. 
These hubs are agile innovation centers aimed at delivering breakthrough technologies to keep our customers ahead of the challenges they face. They also foster collaborative partnerships with academia and other organizations to bring even greater levels of creative and diverse thinking into BAE systems. Of course, space is one of our focus areas, and I will pass to Tom to talk about our new space and mission systems business. Over to you, Tom. Thanks, Charles. When we announced our intent to acquire Ball Aerospace back in August, we described three important trends in our world for which the Ball Aerospace team was particularly well positioned. These trends are the inexorable shift of our customers' priorities to the space domain, the increased interest in Earth and solar science and the health of our planet, and finally, the realization driven by the conflict in Ukraine that global munitions capacity had atrophied over the years and needed recapitalization while stockpiles needed replenishment. These trends have continued, and we expect will continue for years to come. Well positioned for these trends, Ball Aerospace, now a new operating segment within the BA Systems US business called Space and Mission Systems, brings a robust portfolio of solutions across a broad spectrum of customers in space, tactical solutions, and ground systems. These three key growth businesses driven by significant technology differentiators, align well with high priority areas in the U.S. National Defense Strategy and the U.S. Intelligence Strategy. Ball Aerospace brings a deep understanding of their customers' missions, along with the know-how and technology to deliver winning solutions in areas like space domain awareness, environmental monitoring, highly advanced antenna systems, and remote sensing analytics. Adding to BA Systems' broad portfolio of long-term programs, the new space and mission systems business enjoys a similarly strong program mix across the various life cycle stages, from early design through production and into operations and support. These programs underpin the significant long-term value embedded across all three business areas. Throughout the acquisition process, we reaffirm the excellent cultural fit that Ball Aerospace has with our broader business with a mission-focused team, world-class capabilities, and a spirit of innovation that are very well aligned with our mission and our values. High-quality businesses are characterized by talented people, differentiated technology, and a commitment to excellence. Ball Aerospace has demonstrated all of these key qualities and will help us build on the long and distinguished track record of trusted innovation and performance we share. In sum, our new space and mission systems business is a very welcome addition to our portfolio, aligning us well with key growth trends and customer priorities. From here, and as we've demonstrated with previous acquisitions in recent years, we are focused on ensuring a smooth and effective integration to unlock the considerable value and growth this business promises to deliver. Back to you, Charles. Thanks, Tom. Moving on to the forward visibility we have and the longevity of our programs. At £70 billion, pounds, our backlog has increased 50% in the last three years, providing a strong base for growth. We have always said this is really just a subset of the actual visibility we have. In the past, we have looked to illustrate the medium to long-term outlook across various programs. On this slide, we have brought this together to show that our estimate for funded plus incumbent backlog is several multiples higher, with some examples detailed of the true long-term value for the likes of our F-35 program work share, Dreadnought Submarine, and Typhoon support. Additional information is in the backup material, which shows that many of our core programs and franchises run well into the next decade. This underpins our high degree of confidence in our medium to long-term growth prospects. This long-term program evolution is reflected on this slide with even our shorter cycle work often running for several years. We are essentially a long-term contracting and delivery business, which means that our awards made now will be traded out over many years to come, often with slow starts as new programs ramp up. And you can see a number of our major programs like Hunter, AUKUS, GCAT, and even combat vehicle programs like TV-90 exports are in their early phases and will be delivered over the coming years with corresponding financial returns and retirement of risk. We are now seeing the genuine power of our global portfolio. Our business is uniquely diverse in terms of geographic footprint and the broad spectrum of our capabilities, 
And that's proving to be a real strength with all sectors growing sales in the year. Looking ahead, our key growth drivers are also spread across our major geographies and include huge multinational endeavors. Although in an early phase, the AUKUS agreement is significant for the group in the medium and long term, as is the global combat air program. These multinational endeavors highlight the global reach, scale, and longevity of our business. So where do we see future opportunities? Put simply, we have a strong pipeline across all sectors as countries around the world face up to the increasingly multifaceted threat environment. The need to restock and upgrade heavy armor and munitions is an area where our portfolio is particularly relevant and has already seen strong order flow. In addition, we have a pipeline of new opportunities in long-term structural growth markets to further enhance our current base expectations. These are listed here, but include orders for more typhoons, U.S. combat vehicles from foreign military sales, TV-90, BBS-10 and Archer awards, and MBDA exports, as well as the electronic systems content we have on many U.S. helicopter, combat air, and precision munitions platforms. Wrapping up, the BAE Systems team delivered a strong year as we build on our reliable track record of operational and financial performance. Strategically, we aim to generate long-term value and leverage core technology capabilities to position the portfolio for evolving customer priorities and future growth areas. We're performing well, but I see tremendous potential in the coming years due to our continued focus on program performance and driving margin expansion our record order backlog and leading technology solutions, the investments we're making to support the future, our geographic diversity and broad spectrum of capabilities combined with our global opportunity pipeline, and our strong balance sheet and cash generation and disciplined, value-enhancing capital allocation. We achieved a significant amount in 2023 as our people continued to deliver for our customers and other stakeholders. That includes our leadership teams, managers, employees, trade unions, and partners up and down our supply chains. These strong results would not have been possible without them. We will now turn it over to questions. Thank you. We will now begin the question and answer session. As a reminder, to ask a question, you will need to press star 11 on your telephone. Please stand by while we compile the Q&A roster. Our first question comes from the line of Robert Stoller from Vertical Research. Thank you. Thanks so much. Good morning. Thanks so much. Morning, Rob. Good morning. morning, guys. A um, couple from me. Um, first of all, um, Charles, you mentioned about contract discipline and on this whole issue of fixed price contracts. I was wondering, are you assuming with regard to cost inflation on these fixed price contracts in 2024? And are there any fixed price development contracts we should be keeping an eye on? And then secondly, a couple of quick numbers questions for Brad. Um, what are your thoughts on debt pay down post ball from here and the interest cost? And also do you expect the tax rate to stay at around 21%? Thank you. Yeah, I think what we, what I meant on the fixed price contracts uh, specifically, we've been, we've taken a pretty prudent position on these for quite some time, as you know, Rob. Uh, and it means that, you know, when I look at our contractual backlog, I feel, uh, you know, pretty, uh, comfortable around our position uh, from fixed price contracting. Certainly, when I came to be, a, we, we, I inherited a few, uh, you know, quite challenging contracts, and it actually meant that we were, we, we've, we've been very disciplined in, in recent years. And it means that if I look at our contractual backlog now, I think that we, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm pleased with, with where we are, and I don't see any, uh, you know, really challenging contracts with, within that mix. So uh, it's uh, continue, con continuation of that strong contracting discipline, I think, positions as well for the future. Maybe over to you, Brad, second one. Yeah, good morning, Rob. So um, I think on the on the leverage question, uh, first of all, you, you noted our, our much better uh, cash performance in 2023 led to, uh, you know, a pretty solid, uh, you know, 0.3 net debt EBITDA. So I think we, we start the year with a really strong position and, and that means that what we guided to back in August when we talked about the, the debt required for the, uh, access to ball aerospace being circa 1.7, um, what we're seeing now is, is a number that's going to be less than that in the outturn uh, for 24. 
So I think that's a really good uh, good position to be in. So you know, relative to uh, to our U.S. peer group, uh, for instance, it's it's a it's a really strong leverage ratio. So I think we're in good shape. We will continue to delever as we uh, move forward across the medium term, just as free cash uh, builds in the business. Um, but I'm I'm certainly comfortable with uh, you know a, a net debt of you know, between 1.5 1.7, which is what what we're guiding to. And then I think you asked about the tax rate, Rob. Yeah. So, you know, we, we are seeing an increase, as we talked about, in, in 24, um, and that's largely from the U.K. tax regime um, that steps up this year. Uh, so, you know, that takes it up to about 21%. Um, and that's a number that we think will, will be stable across the medium term. So I think it's going to be in that range. That's great. Thank you very much. Thank you for the question. One moment for the next question. Next question comes from the line of Ian Douglas Pennon from UBS. Please go ahead. Thanks very much for um, taking my question. So um, I've got I've got three. If that's uh, quick, if that's okay, but they're all quite quick. Um, first on uh, maritime business. So the dreadnought pull forward. It looks like that continued uh, in the second half of this year. Uh, what is your expectation for 2024? Should we ex uh, continue to see uh, business pulled forward, uh, or will you give some of that back? Um, secondly, your cash flow uh, guidance. I guess I've got two questions here. Cash flow guidance. 2024 looks um, conservative to me. Why would you not expect continued uh, um, deposits being received, uh, given your, what your your current statements just on uh, on order strength? Uh, and then also on, on cash flow, um, it also seems conservative, your 2023 to 2025 stack of more than $5 billion. This would imply something like $1.1 billion for 2025, which seems, um, which seems unlikely. Perhaps you could comment. Thank you. Yeah, so good morning, Ian. So, yeah, I think uh, you know, the, the dreadnought acceleration was, was pretty profound in 2023. So, you know, that, that type of growth rate is not going to continue into 24. Um, we do see dreadnought revenues picking up from 24 or from 23 levels, so there will be an increase. But the rate of increase uh, should start abating a little bit. Um, and then on, on cash flow, you know, I, I think the, the first thing is – to reflect on the really strong cash delivery across these uh, last couple of years. And if you take the, the number that we printed at 23 combined with the 24 number, you know, that's a pretty strong two-year total. So that's one. And I think you're right to, to reflect on the advances. And we never guide to material cash uh, advance inflow. And not all orders have cash advances associated with them. So um, I think the the reality is we're likely to see some net advance burn in 24 on the back of the really high advance we received in 23. Um, so I think that's really what kind of colors that, that um, 1.3 billion guide for 24. And um, and there could be upside if we do have orders that have, um, you know, higher advances associated with them, but we never guide to those material order inflows that have advances. So I think that's also the same answer for your question on the 23 to 25 range. Um, I mean, if we are to receive um, advances on, you know, on order inflow across that period, it could be upside to what we printed there. Yeah, just worth reminding, that's why we do a three-year cash guide, because of the uh, in-year volatility as, you know, things move from one year to the next. Thank you. Thank you for the questions. One moment for the next question. Next question comes from the line of David Perry from J.P. Morgan. Please go ahead. Uh, yes, good morning, Charles, Brad, and Tom. Um, I've got a okay. couple of questions for Tom, if I may, just on Ball Aero, seeing as that's the sort of new bit of the business, and then uh, some for you, Charles, if I may. Uh, Tom, just educational questions, if I may. Um, on Ball, it's on slide 18, it says 15% of sales are in civil space. Can you just clarify what that is? Is that is that commercial telco? Is it institutional or government? Uh, and then the slightly left for your question, it just been a lot of press coverage this week about Russia using space as a new frontier for warfare. Just makes me wonder whether war can play a role in, in, in stopping that. 
Shall, shall I stop there and then maybe come back for Charles if that's okay? Thank you. Yeah, very good. And good morning, David. Uh, as to the civil space question, civil space in the context we describe it has to do with the civil agencies in the U.S. and, and nothing to do with commercial telecoms. Uh, civil space and civil agencies in the U.S. include the likes of NASA, uh, NOAA, which is the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. These are uh, agencies that are responsible for Earth observation, um, some of the scientific missions that took place in space, I mean, Ball played a big role in the James Webb Space Telescope, for example. And so these are uh, programs where we're, we're talking about highly sophisticated instruments, uh, which Ball is, uh, is very highly qualified for. These are some programs and capabilities that date back decades uh, and require uh, unique, uh, unique technologies. And so uh, a whole is not a is not part of what we would refer to as commercial uh, telecom uh, satellites. I hope that's helpful. And then with yeah, respect to the very question, good. very good. Uh, and then with respect to the uh, recent press around Russia's um, aspirations in space, I mean this this is not a surprise, and in fact dates back some time, uh, both in Russia and China. China, as you might recall, shot down one of its own satellites back in 2007. Uh, which sent a bit of a shockwave around the world as they uh, were making the point that the, the, that these satellites are not uh, invulnerable out there. Uh, and so that, you'd imagine, would uh, spark interest in uh, the ability to defend uh, these satellites uh, through a variety of means, uh, not unlike we defend aircraft uh, at lower altitudes against uh, enemy uh, threats. And so, um, you know, the, the kinds of technologies that uh, Paul uh, has uh, demonstrated, you know, coupled with the, the sorts of things we do in our electronic warfare business, uh, you could imagine uh, might be of interest uh, in, this, in that sort of situation. Okay. One, one to watch. Thanks, Tom. Um, Charles, my questions for you. I, I know they're slightly sensitive topics, so you're limited in what you can say, but is, is there anything you can share with us on GCAP talks in terms of timing, work share that might be planned, and also interesting that, that Germany seems to be uh, rowing back a little bit on sanctions on, on, on um, exports to Saudi Arabia. So is, is there anything you can say there vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Eurofighter? Thank you. Uh, well, was obviously the limit, as you uh, can imagine, David, is what I can see. I mean, GCAP, we're making good progress, uh, both uh, company, the three companies and uh, and the, th the three nations. Uh, and I think that, you know, things are, are cracking on there. And, and there's not, not much more I can say other than we continue to get good support from uh, from the UK government on, on this. Uh, on Eurofighter, I think that we are, I mean, as I've said previously, I think we're, we're, we're well placed for further uh, Eurofighter orders. Um, there's a, a range of opportunities uh, from uh, existing Middle East customers, and also from from Europe, uh, either follow-ons from uh, Germany or um, or Spain, and, and actually a range of other countries that are considering the Eurofighter platform as, as we speak. So I think that the Eurofighter platform, our sort of planning assumption, worth worth reminding everyone, is sort of a stable outlook uh, for quite some years to come. Uh, based on existing orders, but there is uh, is upside potential there. Okay, again, one to watch. Thanks, gents. Appreciate it. Thanks so much, David. Thank you for the questions. Next question comes from the line of Josh Zhao from Bernstein. Please go ahead. Yeah. Hi. Um. Good morning, everyone. Um. First one um, for Tom, I guess. Um. You know, in the U.S., you know, if we don't see the 24 budget pass, and that triggers the one percent automatic cut in April, you know, I guess, how do you evaluate what that impact will have across your U.S. business this year? And second one for uh, Charles or Brad, you know, you've talked about this enhanced visibility, you know, confidence in the long-term outlook. You know, we don't, we know that you typically don't give longer-term growth targets, but you know, based on your order book and future opportunities, you know, how do you think about this year's 5-7% organic growth within this upcoming period of sustained growth? Thanks. Maybe, Tom, you want to do the U.S. budget sure. first? And then... good, good morning. Thanks for the question. You know, certainly all eyes are on uh, Congress at the moment as we watch uh, the deliberations over the budget. Uh, as we consider its impact on our portfolio, you know, first and foremost, with respect to a CR, as you know, 
it, it has the biggest impact on new starts. It prevents the start of new uh, programs uh, in that current uh, government fiscal year. Uh, we're fortunate in that much of our portfolio does not depend on uh, that, that sort of uh, event. Uh, and so we're, we're hopeful and optimistic that this uh, 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 continuing resolution period, which will end for the defense budget on March 8th, uh, will, will result in a, a, a passage of a budget. Uh, although I think, you know, we're, we're confident that the impact uh, up to that point in time will not be material, and we'll just have to watch it much beyond that. We're also watching the supplemental, um, and, uh, you know, that uh, represents upside uh, to the plan. Um, you know, remember also that much of the U.S. Uh, portfolio uh, uh, or you know, a good portion of the U.S. portfolio does not depend on the uh, DOD budget and uh, including our commercial uh, business and you know, the work we're doing over at uh, Haglund's in uh, combat vehicles uh, in Eastern Europe, et cetera. Uh, and so we're, we're, uh, we're obviously watching the budget closely, but uh, we're feeling like the, uh, our portfolio is, is in pretty good shape. Yeah, on the uh, second point, George, um, I mean, the comments in the outlook, I, I mean, I, I point to the fact that, you know, we've got a record order backlog as we speak, having had two, um, you know, cracking years in terms of order intake. I mean, that gives us, you know, really good visibility for the next five years. And then we've got, as we've said already, these, uh, you know, sort of huge programs like uh, AUKUS and GCAP that give us the long-term visibility beyond that for, you know, another five, ten years, uh, you know, well into the future. And I think it's that sort of stronger for longer outlook that we're um, that we're really thinking about here. That uh, we see momentum in the business that carries us, uh, you know, I mean, well into the next decade and and and, and beyond. And I think it's that it's that the concept that, that that we're now looking at this these longer growth rates uh, and the recruiting numbers that we're we're really planning for that long term growth trajectory uh, ahead of us. Thanks. Thank you for the questions. One moment for the next question. Next question comes from Delisle, Ross Law from Morgan Stanley. Please go ahead. Hi, good morning everyone, and uh, thank you for taking my questions. Um, the first, just following up on the, the free cash flow guidance. So out with advances, what would you highlight as the key moving parts that will determine to what extent uh, you go beyond the 1.3 billion? And then uh, a few follow-ups also on ball. Uh, so the revenue miss in 23, can you maybe just flesh out exactly um, what those delays were, were due to? And do we see that being caught up in, in 24 and is that being baked into the guidance? And then lastly, on, on the margin, obviously 11% was much better than the, the 10% you were initially forecasting. Is it fair now to assume that that probably puts a bit of upward pressure on your 12% plus margin guide uh, for ball over the medium term? Thanks. Yeah, morning, Ross. Um, so I think on the on the cash flow, I mean, obviously, um, you know, our ability to, to deliver our capex above depreciation is is going to have a, a, a an effect on that. But um, we're investing in important areas of the business to, to drive efficiency as we as we continue to do. Um, I think working capital efficiency in general is something that we are driving hard on. And we we did have a little bit of inventory build at the end of of 2023. So we have some room for improvement on, on working capital efficiency. Um, and then I think the biggest variable is, is going to be the advanced story, um, you know, advanced burn relative to advanced intake. Um, but all those factors are going to play a role. But, um, you know, we, we, we give a guide, and, and uh, we hope to beat it. Uh, Tom? Uh, uh, well, sure. Uh, thanks, Russ. Good morning. Uh, so I'd say like others in national security space, Ball saw some delays and shifts in customer sequencing in 2023 driven by budget priorities in the continuing resolution, which began at the end of calendar year, the beginning of the government fiscal year. Uh, we're, you know, our, we're fully confident as the budget settles in that those sales will play through in 24 and beyond. You know, the specifics of the programs, given these are restricted uh, programs, is not much more we can say about that in detail, but we do expect that to all come back uh, here in 24 and beyond. I hope that's helpful. On the margin story. Yeah. Right, the, mar the, yeah. the margin side of the story is a good one, right? I mean, you've, you saw the margin expansion as we had uh, predicted. It demonstrates the ability of all uh, to reach those kind of margin levels. And as we look at the cross synergies uh, we described uh, during our announcement of the acquisition, 
uh, which we're already beginning to, uh, to lay in the plans for, uh, we expect that will continue. Yeah, and if I could just add to that, uh, Tom, the, the one of the drivers for margin involved was the increase in their, their tactical business and their mix. And, you know, that, that is a higher margin part of their business. And what we are seeing is that that part of the business is growing faster across the medium term, which is only, you know, helpful for, for margin. And as Tom mentioned, the synergies on top of that um, is it's what gives us confidence that we can do, you know, better than 12% for that business over the medium term. Great, very clear. Thank you all. Thanks, Ross. Thank you for the questions. Our next question comes from the line of Nick Cunningham from Agency Partners. Good morning, thanks. Um, yeah, yes, I'm, I'm heading into my 39th year of, um, of analyzing BAE, and uh, I'm not used to things going quite so well, so uh, I tend to make one feel a bit nervous and look, look around for problems. And the only sort of really obvious identifiable area is the U.S. budget, which is uh, already been touched upon. Um, but it does seem to be becoming more extensive as an issue. You know, we've seen FAR cancelled and reportedly S35 is going to be cut back in the uh, PBR. Um, and also we've seen profit hits at Northrop, Lockheed and Boeing. So the, the question is that uh, you've touched upon the fact that commercial and Sweden um, help a lot in offsetting um, any of that. Um, but presumably another offset should be um, direct exports um, out of the U.S., particularly for armor, given that you have such a large installed base worldwide of legacy programs. So, so the question is, what's the prospect for that? Over what kind of time scale can we, can we expect to see that start to happen? And, and in the longer run, what sort of proportion of, of revenues out of that business um, are you going to be able to sell overseas? Thank you. I'll pull you in, Tom, but I think just worth uh, remembering, Nick, is one of our great strengths is that global portfolio of ours, which means that you know, we are much more widespread than uh, I think any of our peers, and, and, and that gives us you know, real visibility as, as we look forward. But maybe over to you, Tom, to say a little bit about that. And I think the other thing to remember, of course, is our relative lack of exposure to some of the big uh, fixed-price uh, you know, developmental-type programs yeah. that we've deliberately, uh, not just in the U.S., but elsewhere, um, you know, taken very prudent approaches towards. Head over to you, Tom. Thank you, Charles. And good morning, Nick, and happy 39th anniversary. <laughs> Thanks, yes, my 78th set of results, I think. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's right. Um, so, so directly at the question around uh, the potential for international sales on combat vehicles, I mean, clearly as the uh, AMPV, uh, the Armored Multipurpose Vehicles, makes its way into full rate production, uh, we find ourselves in a position where uh, international interest in that is, is starting to pick up a bit. You'll recall that the AMPV is the replacement for the M113, the Vietnam era uh, vehicle, of which by uh, some counts there are 100,000 of around the world in some 30 variants. And so uh, we think the potential for uh, AMPV as a replacement in the longer run for these M113s around the world uh, is, is good. Um, we are, uh, with the U.S. Army, on contract for five variants currently. We've got a couple of others that we've demonstrated uh, as we look to expand the potential of that vehicle. Remember, the MP stands for multipurpose, and so that's the, the goal is to, uh, to expand the scope of that vehicle and in so doing uh, make it that much more attractive for various services around the world. Um, you know, I think the, the – uh, performance in Ukraine of systems like the M777. I mean, everyone's read the, the news clips around uh, you know, the, how, how well a number of these systems are performing. Uh, and again, not just vehicles and combat and artillery, but also APKWS, right, the uh, laser-guided rocket system that is now being deployed in counter UAS applications very successfully. Uh, that is being taken notice of around the world, and we expect uh, to see um, you know, an uptick in uh, uh, foreign military sales uh, there as well. And, of course, we mentioned uh, CB90 a bit earlier. Uh, so we're, we are optimistic, Nick, that uh, the, the visibility these systems have gotten in Ukraine and the opportunity to take what is the first next-generation combat vehicle in production in the U.S. Uh, into international markets uh, is good. Uh, th just quickly to Charles's point, uh, you know, we are – Knock on wood, as we say this, but the, the, uh, you, you don't see a significant set of write-downs 
across our programs. We've been very diligent in our portfolio around uh, the risk levels and appetite that we have for that. Uh, and so that has put us in a good position, and we expect that diligence to continue. Uh, I think Ball, as we learn more about their programs now that we've owned them for three days, um, we, uh, we see they had taken a very similar posture, uh, especially with respect to some of that early fixed price uh, space uh, related uh, activity. So I'll leave it there. I hope that's helpful. Thank you, John. Thank you. Uh, just a very short follow up. In terms of physical capacity in Armour and also personnel, given the issues that the industry has been facing in the US and getting people, do you have the capacity to, to look at near term exporting? A great question. We have uh, worked with the U.S. Army to project our, uh, the ability to expand uh, that capacity. Actually, have some of that going on. We've described in the past what we refer to as our combat vehicle manufacturing network uh, that transcends uh, the main facility in York uh, down into Aiken, South Carolina, uh, Elgin, Oklahoma, um, and beyond. And uh, the point we've, we've worked to spread, the, spread some of these programs around so that we're not dependent on one geography. As far as talent goes, you know, we are fortunate by virtue of that geography that the concentration of people in that area, the concentration of competing industries in that area is pretty low. And so we've been able to retain that talent. We worked through, as many did, um, you know, the uh, various union agreements in places where that's relevant and uh, have come out of that successfully. We're confident that will continue. Yeah, I mean, just on that point, on Alan, it's worth saying that you know, I've identified last year that our ability to Hire, retain, work, train and retain the talent was obviously one of the, the risk areas for us as we saw the strength of the order pipeline. But I'm very pleased with the progress that we've made and with that 7,000 net addition uh, over the course of the, uh, over the, uh, the entire global portfolio last year, I think that, that, that really underlines the strength of our early, early careers programs and our ability to uh, attract and, and, and train those people coming into the business. So I'm, I'm pleased with that progress more still to be done in 24 and 25, but having achieved what we've achieved in 23, I think we've tested the system and shown that we can uh, can deliver those sort of numbers. Thank, thank you. Thank you for the questions. Next question comes from the line of Chloe Remari from Jeffrey. Please go ahead. Yes, good morning, Charles, Brad and Tom. Um, if I could have three questions, please. The first one is on uh, the Australian decision to cut the Hunter class uh, program to six frigates. Uh, what would that mean for order intake this year, if you'd put anything on the last uh, three frigates already? And are there any offsetting impacts for you, given their strong investment into naval overall? Um, the second is on PNS. The 2023 margin guide uh, is called for a quite strong uh, margin improvement, uh, given that this division was the key driver for the group overall um, uh, margin momentum. Should we assume that from 2024, you've kind of reached your full margin potential beyond the uh, both synergies impacts? And third question is on maritime. The dreadnought pull forward didn't seem to come with the margin headwind that I expected. So could you share maybe any of the offsetting impact you've seen in uh, 2023, please? Yeah, so uh, let me take uh, Hunter myself. Um, so we hadn't uh, even we didn't even have batch one in the order intake. So uh, the fact that we've got uh, a class of six confirmed and an important point from the announcements is continuous shipbuilding at the Osborne precinct. I mean that gives us visibility of, of work right the way through the next decade and beyond. So I think that you know that leaves us I think very well positioned. Part of that decision, as you are probably well aware, was the decision of, of the Australian government to buy nuclear-powered uh, hunter-killer attack submarines does change the requirement from, for an ASW frigate or number of, of ASW frigates, which is reflected in, in the number. But as I said, I think that commitment to uh, continuous shipbuilding in the Osborne precinct is, is, is very good news. And I think that the uh, decision will be now to bring the, uh, the six hunter-class frigates uh, put that on, on, onto contract, and obviously at some point here, uh, I expect uh, this year, that will come into the order backlog and be a, a significant order for the, for the business. On PNS margins, I mean, some, some good news there. Over to you, Tom, on that. Yeah. I'll bring you in on uh, 
Great. Hey, um, Marco, thanks for the question. Uh, so we have been on a, a, a very uh, deliberate journey at PNS over the last handful of years as we've worked to modernize our facility through investment. We have, as I've mentioned before, robotic welding capability, brand new uh, uh, machining uh, towers, uh, and, and all of the design around putting ourselves in a position to expand margins there. That coupled with the fact that we are winding down the LRIP or long, uh, or excuse me, uh, limited rate initial production phases of the AMPV contract, uh, and uh, we are we're now fully priced in our uh, fixed rate, uh, full rate production programs uh, to transition uh, into that uh, into that spot. Um, you know, as, as to the question of can we go beyond, we we will we have not given up on our our ability to uh, to further expand margins there, and we suspect again as the program mix uh, continues to mature, you know, we continue to look for ways uh, to deliver uh, to li deliver that expanded margin. On the uh, maritime margins, Brett. Yeah, morning, Chloe. Um, yeah, I think, you know, first of all, looking at, at group level, I think we, we did see this really profound increase in maritime sales in 23, and, and you're right to point out that as a, as a mix effect, um, that, that puts a little bit of a, a headwind on the, on the profit, but that's why we're really pleased to see you know, us having a stable margin in 23, and it really is a testament to really strong performance across the group. And you look at 80 basis points of expansion in the air sector, you know, that was part of the story. Um, you know, good margin expansion in PNS. Um, so across the group, we were able to offset that um, higher, uh, lower margin maritime activity with really strong performance and overall keep margin stable. And as we move to 24, uh, as Tom has mentioned, you know, we still have a pathway up on margin expansion in PNS in particular. So getting to 10% uh, as a sector. Um, is, a, is a really good milestone, and, you know, I, I think uh, there are some opportunities to continue to draw that margin higher, um, and we're guiding in 24, as you can see, to have a, a higher EBIT growth than our sales growth. So we are focused on margin expansion across the medium term, and, you know, we continue to, to see proper ways to do that. Very clear. Thank you. Thank you for the questions. One moment for the next questions. Next question comes from Christopher Lenot from Deutsche Bank. Please go ahead. Uh, yes, uh, good morning, Charles, Brad, and Tom. Um, I had three questions. The first one, um, going back on Nick's question on the FMS sales, uh, can you quantify what share of the 37.7 billion of order intake it represents in in 2023, and do you expect that to continue to grow in 2024, and are they coming with prepayments? Uh, that's the first question. The second question is on CapEx and R&D in 2024. I, can you or have you quantified um, the, um, I mean, the, basically the, the levels you're expecting in, in the year? And the last question is on slide nine. You, you, you mentioned strong cash conversion in 2024 to 2026. Uh, again, uh, any possibility to quantify this um, in the light of, of, of course, your, your, your free cash flow guidance? Thank you. Uh, on FMS sales, as a percent, I'm not sure we have that. Uh, yeah, I mean, much of that, as, as we were pointing out, is, is just in the very formative stages of, uh, you know, being able to clarify what that will be. We expect that would manifest in the probably medium term, but the demand signals are just starting to come through. Very difficult to predict, you know, the levels to which that will will get. Um, and then CapEx, uh, R&D in 2024, and, and cash conversion rates as we look forward? What? Yeah, so, hi, Christoph. I think you'll see, again, uh, a higher CapEx and depreciation in 24. Um, so, you know, and we're, we're investing across our sectors for the growth that we see. And um, so you will see higher CapEx over depreciation. And I, I think on R&D, uh, I think you'll, you'll continue to see us increase our, our self-funded R&D across the medium term. Um, we, we see a lot of, of opportunities to bring differentiation um, in, in our key areas of business. And so R&D has been an important part of, of delivering that. And you see us you know, invest in electronic systems um, and the air sector primarily is how we allocate that, that self-funded R&D. And, you know, those are two sectors that have very strong return on capital. Employees. So uh, we're putting our money where we get really good returns. 
And, and on the um, cash conversion uh, you mentioned in uh, on slide nine. Yeah, I mean, we for 2023, you saw a fantastic cash conversion. Um, you know, also we have to remember the, the influence of advances on that on that number. Um, and as we as we move forward across 24 to 26, um, the, the 24 to 26 period will have a little bit of a net advance burn. Um, so, you know, I think the, the, the cash guide we're giving uh, is is with that burn assumption. And as I said earlier in the call. We don't model or guide to material cash advance inflows, and so to the extent that those come in, you know that that could increase the conversion level. Oh, okay, thank you. Uh, just last, the, the thing FMS sales uh, are they coming with prepayment or not? Yeah, I mean that will vary from uh, from one country to the next, depending on their budget cycles and so forth. I mean we do see. Uh, you know, the, the dominant portion of, uh, of the, these sorts of advanced payments do come from European countries. Uh, it's been our experience, but again, very difficult to predict. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Christoph. Thank you for the question. The next question comes from Ben Elon from Bank of America. Please go ahead. Yes, morning. Uh, Thank you for taking the question. I just had one on on M and A. I mean, the leverage is uh, in 24 still going to be uh, relatively uh, manageable. So, how are you feeling about M and A from here? Are you still focused on technology bolt-ons? Have you changed anything about how you're thinking geographically uh, around opportunities? Is there still a good pipeline of opportunities? So, just some color around the M and A environment would be uh, would be super helpful. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, we're very, very much uh, still in the market for, uh, you know, small bolt-on uh, M&A opportunities, uh, as, we've done, uh, as we've done in the past. You saw already uh, this year we announced the acquisition of Malloy, uh, and, you know, these are small tuck-ins, but um, we'll, we'll continue to, to, to look for those in the kind of areas that we've spoken about before, sort of multi-domain, autonomy, uh, space, uh, if we can find the right sort of uh, – uh, areas to tuck into the business. Cool. Very clear. Thank you, Charles. Thank you for the questions. As a reminder to ask questions, please press star 1 1 and wait for a name to be announced. One moment for the next questions. The next question comes from the line of Emery Poland from Kepler Chevrolet. Please go ahead. Yes, thank you very much for, for taking my question. I have three, please. Uh, the, the first one is on the, um, uh, the, the industrial bottleneck that, that could emerge. Obviously, we, we see booming conditions in a number of areas in, in Europe in particular, and I was curious about uh, uh, the potential uh, critical bottlenecks in the supply chain, whether it's components or materials. If you could uh, give us some color on that and how uh, BA is prepared for, for this and how it could cap perhaps the, the growth prospect uh, of the company. Uh, compared to the demand potential. Uh, secondly, um, you mentioned Ukraine as have, starting to having an impact on the top line. Uh, would you be able to quantify this for 23 and, and uh, how you see that uh, panning out in the, in the coming uh, two years in light of the restocking uh, uh, impact you, you, you also flagged? And, and, and last, uh, you, you mentioned your, your M&A uh, focus, but uh, uh, clearly the Ukraine uh, war has probably highlighted uh, some uh, uh, lessons uh, in terms of uh, the type of equipment and the tactics that uh, are, are now more, more uh, relevant and perhaps other, other programs may, may become less uh, uh, strategic. Uh, so would that mean that in the portfolio there may be some errors uh, you would consider uh, as less uh, relevant in the future and potential disposal candidates? Thank you. Uh, on industrial bottlenecks, it's something that we obviously monitor very carefully and, and obviously challenges through the pandemic uh, and then the impact of the uh, Ukraine conflict has obviously challenged uh, all of us. But I think we've done a, a pretty good job of navigating through that, uh, you know, largely because it's trying to stay ahead of the curve, identify those bottlenecks before they become uh, real issues for us. So it's not without challenge, but one that, um, you know, we're now, I think, well used to and, and, and handling uh, quite effectively. Um, 
Ukraine impact is actually quite hard to quantify because there's sort of, you know, restocking the sort of immediate impacts, and then there's, uh, you know, government defense spending increases starting to come through in the light of the elevated threat environment and European nations, uh, you know, obviously trying to you know, increase their defense spending and get either two or above the, 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 the 2%. So some of that is coming through, but I wouldn't put a number on it. We've in the past said that about 10% of our business is sort of short cycle activities, you know, things like uh, munitions, uh, our share of NBDA and, and, and some of those things. And obviously they are seeing uh, an impact because of it, but it's quite hard to, to, to quantify. And, and, and the bulk of our uh, performance has come from these big long-term programs. Uh, you know, not directly related uh, mm. to Ukraine. Uh, from an M&A focus, um, yeah, I mean, we are learning lessons, as, as you can imagine, uh, from Ukraine. I don't, from my perspective, it, there's nothing that causes us dramatically to relook at our portfolio, but there are certain areas, uh, I mean, obviously things like uh, effective ISR, autonomy, the multi-domain uh, drivers that we've been looking at for a number of years. It just reinforces some of the themes and some areas like electronic warfare, where we already uh, have uh, very strong lead leadership positions. I mean, they are really coming to the fore in a, in a, a, a contested sort of multi-domain uh, uh, near-peer environment. Thank you very much. So I think we're, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, we're now uh, all done on questions. So uh, I'd just like to... Uh, to, to wrap the call up here and thank you uh, all for joining. Many of you on the call will be seeing uh, out on the road shows, which we're uh, actually starting uh, tomorrow uh, in Miami. So uh, we're looking forward to meeting many of you uh, in the next couple of weeks. Thank you very much.